All right, so now 70 year old woman with large deep soft tissue mass in the buttock. And we've also got MRI and gross uh, photos for this. So here is the MRI images here. You can see a very large mass in the musculature and it's very heterogeneous, right? Multiple lobules, different signal intensity. Here's another view. And I'm not a radiologist. I cannot begin to explain at the level a radiologist does, but the, the heterogeneity in a large, deep, soft tissue mass, very concerning to me for a high-grade uh, sarcoma. And here's another view of it. All right. And then the gross photos. And you can see this matches very much with what we saw in the radiology, right? This heterogeneity, you know, myxoid to mucus, gelatinous, uh, yellowish areas, firm, fleshy, white areas, and uh, big cystic spaces with probably uh, some of which represent necrosis and also hemorrhage throughout. And here's uh, the outside view, which is what a lot of uh, soft tissue tumors, when they get taken out, they just come out as a ball with some fascia or a little membranous capsule over the top of it, and maybe some fascia attached, maybe some muscle attached. Um, this is the outside, they look kind of the same. All sarcomas look like this when they get removed, but when you cut it in half, that's when you get to see uh, the internal uh, components. So now let's see what the path looks like. So we got several slides here. So here is number one. And even from low power, you can see very cellular zones and areas of necrosis and hemorrhage that match just like what you'd expect from the gross. Here's a different, very unique patterned area here. More with lots of necrosis. And then we'll come back and look closer, but just wanted to show the appearance from low power. So... I have a guess on this one, but I'm not very sure. All right, go for it. If you get it right, I'll leave it in. If you get it wrong, I'll edit it out. How about that? <laughs> pleomorphic liposarcoma. Very good. Well done. How look? Yeah, this is a pleomorphic liposarcoma. So this is, by definition, these are um, high-grade sarcomas that have pleomorphic lipoblasts, okay? Mm -hmm. They can have a wide range of patterns. Just like DDIF has a wide range of patterns, so pleomorphic has a wide range of patterns too, okay? They can be either pleomorphic spindle cells that resemble undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Sometimes they can be epithelioid. This one has a little bit of both. We've got pleomorphic spindle cells in here. We also have areas that are epithelioid or even almost round cell appearing. And then the lipoblasts sometimes are very focal. Other times they're numerous. In this case, they're numerous lipoblasts, okay? A lot of these end up being kind of univaculated, but most of the time you have multiple uh, vacuoles that indent on the nucleus, okay? Mm -hmm. So they can really run a range. But there are times where you have to hunt around quite a bit to find the lipoblast. But here, all of these cells are showing uh, lipoblastic differentiation. I'm trying to find a good multinucleated one. Many of these are, are kind of single or double vacuoles. And uh, lipoblasts are, you know, they have lipid in the cytoplasm. And lipid is going to make a sphere when it's in an aqueous solution. Our bodies are made of water. So when you have a true lipid droplet in a cell, it's going to be round. It's going to wash out during processing because the fat dissolves and leave a white space, a clear hole, right, which is going to look white. Mm -hmm. And because it's a lipid droplet, it's going to push everything out of the way. So it often indents the nucleus, which gives you this kind of signet ring look right here. Or on a multinucleate or a multivaculated one, it will have like little scalloped indentations into the nucleus. We can, I can't get any higher. Oh, you can kind of see here, uh, scallops and mm -hmm. scoops in. It's because it's a lipid droplet like a little droplet of oil it has to push everything water out of its way right so i think that's how you can tell there are other types of cells that can be kind of bubbly either because of glycogenation or what's called a pseudo lipoblast where you pick uh, sucks up mucin or myxoid from the stroma and then those though are not quite so perfect and sharp so i do have a video about um lipoblast versus pseudo lipoblast and i'll put a link to that down below you can check it out um, and, and it shows some examples. And so this one, we have lots and lots of lipoblastic differentiation and epithelioid areas. Then we had uh, more spindled areas. Oh, and then also here's some big bizarre pleomorphic cells. And this is something that I've seen in other sarcomas too, but I feel like I see it more often in pleomorphic liposarcoma. And I don't know, maybe it's been described in the literature and I just overlooked it, but these droplets, I think they're like proteinaceous material, pink hyalinized droplets 
are in, I find them often in the cells of pleomorphic liposarcoma. But again, you can see them in other sarcomas. But if I see something that looks like a pleomorphic sarcoma and I start seeing these pink droplets, I go look around more closely for lipoblasts in a, in a sarcoma like that. The other thing is that this case is actually not the best example of it, but of all the sarcomas, pleomorphic liposarcoma has some of the wildest, most ugly atypical nuclei of like, not just sarcoma, of any tumor in the human body. They can have the most bizarre, massive pleomorphic cells. This one is pretty tame, honestly, by comparison. I know this may look very atypical um, if you're starting out, but um, I've seen some other pleomorphic liposarcs that'll have cells 10 times as big as that one. So here's a nice lipoblast here where we've got this clear vacuoles, and it also has the little droplets of proteinaceous stuff in it too. But see how the vacuoles scallop and indent into the nucleus. So if you have a high-grade sarcoma and even one good pleomorphic lipoblast, by definition, that's going to end up being pleomorphic liposarcoma. The only other thing that it could be is it, it could be a D-diff liposarc that happens to have lipoblasts. Most of the time that's in the retroperitoneum, but occasionally you can see D-diffs in the extremities. So as a general rule, high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts in the extremity usually is going to be pleomorphic liposarc. If it's in the retroperitoneum, then it's probably D-diff. There are rare exceptions where you can have D-diff in the extremities, and you can solve that pretty easily by doing MDM2. The treatment is going to be similar. High-grade sarcomas in the extremities get removed. They try to get negative margins. They may use radiation, depending on the strategy of, of you know, different people approach them differently. Chemotherapy may be used if they metastasize, but we don't have like good targeted chemo yet. This is We're making this video right now in January 2022. I hope that someday in the future I'll be wrong about that and we'll have much better targeted um, drugs, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of high-grade adult sarcomas, to my knowledge, don't have really good specific targeted therapies. Now, that said, I'm not an oncologist. I'm a pathologist, so I, I'm an expert in diagnosis, but not in treatment. So I just know the basics of treatment. But the point is, is that we, we make a lot of um, discussion about subdividing high-grade sarcomas in adults. But really, practically speaking, even though there are some differences in behavior, like the, the how, how likely something is to metastasize, the treatment is similar for, for pretty much all of them, um, like the high-grade pleomorphic sarcomas. Now, in kids, there are some different subtypes of sarcoma that actually are treated very differently. There are also some unique subtypes of sarcoma in adults, too, like angiosarcoma has unique considerations. And some others, like particularly the round blue cell tumors, Ewing's and other related tumors, those get handled differently. But the pleomorphic things like undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, pleomorphic liposarc, D-diff liposarc, pleomorphic leiomyosarcoma, pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, all of those get treated pretty much the same way, to my knowledge. Um, uh, so in any case, that's just a, just to point that out there. Um, so, you know, we do stains to subdivide some of those tumors. In a tumor like this, no stains, in my opinion, are needed because you've got a high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts. The only thing that you might do here is if you were thinking that there could be D-diff liposarc, you could do MDM2 um, as fish or immunostain to, to make sure that it wasn't that. All right, so anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the, in the, look at the variation. It's so crazy that you go from these round or epithelioid cells in this abrupt transition into you know, areas with small spindle cells and then scattered big, massive, giant, atypical ones. And so that, there's a, oftentimes in pleomorphic liposarcs a lot of heterogeneity, just like in D-diff liposarcs, where you can have a lot of different changes. And I didn't, uh, I didn't point this out, but you can have mixoid change in these tumors. You can have mixoid background in any of the different subtypes of liposarcoma. So mixoid liposarcoma must have mixoid background, but you can also have mixoid areas in D-diff liposarc, in well-diff liposarc, in pleomorphic liposarcoma. All of these different liposarcomas can have areas that have a lot of mixoid change sometimes. So, um, so that's important to know. And then here, look, this, this is the same tumor, and now we've got areas that are kind of these fusiform oval nuclei, and then right next to it, big lipoblasts in here. And it's just so crazy to me, like how variable the morphology is throughout the tumor. And then, oh, look, this is like kind of dilated, almost staghorn vessels, right? Like you see in a solitary fibrous tumor. This is just a reminder that even those staghorn vessels are a classic feature of solitary fibrous tumor. Lots of different tumors can have that same exact vascular pattern. So we sometimes call it a hemangioparasitic vascular pattern, but it can be seen in many different things. It's not specific for um, solitary fibrous tumor. And it, look, there we got some more lipoblasts right in here. Very nice example. And then over here, 
it's got this very unique kind of like, I don't know what pattern that is, but it's, I guess it's, I don't know how to describe it, but it's got a very distinct and unique pattern over here. And sometimes the, um, when the lipoblasts are so numerous that they form like a sheet, they, and they can, and when you have the epithelioid um, cells with a lot of lipoblasts, sometimes it can almost uh, resemble adrenocortical carcinoma. There is the, the, the epithelioid subtype of pleomorphic liposarc when there are numerous lipoblasts can look kind of like adrenocortical carcinoma. I don't know that this one quite fits for that, but it kind of begins to make me think of it a little bit because there are so many uh, lipoblasts in this case here. Um, but uh, I don't think I've ever seen a case of, you know, metastatic adrenocortical carcinoma in the thigh. So to me, I don't feel like it is a real, real likely to be something that would get confused, but people have pointed out the similarity in their morphology um, sometimes. So, so this is a good one to remember that you can have both epithelioid and spindled um, areas in, in pleomorphic liposarcoma. And I think this is just more of the same that we've been seeing. And this one was just loaded with lipoblasts, tons and tons. And I think, is there anything else on the last one? Nope, just more, more of the same. And these tumors don't have any special immunohistochemical stain. They are really defined by high-grade sarcoma with lipoblast. And uh, they don't have any recurrent molecular abnormality. They are, uh, like many other pleomorphic sarcomas, at random chromosomal gains and losses that are different from case to case. So aneuploidy, as is often the case with many of the pleomorphic sarcomas. So always uh, in, in these tumors, unfortunately, are relatively aggressive. They are more aggressive than most of the other pleomorphic, like they're more aggressive than undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Uh, the last statistics that I had read on this, the five-year survival is about 50%. So they're rapidly aggressive and they metastasize quickly. A lot of them do. So they are, they are very bad tumors, unfortunately, um, and do seem to have a higher risk of metastasis than many of the other pleomorphic adult, adult sarcomas. So uh, a good tumor to know about and keep in mind. And they are kind of the most uncommon of the, of the major subtypes of liposarcoma. They are less common than D-diff and well-diff and less common than myxoid liposarcoma. But interestingly, uh, they sometimes occur in the skin. They're the most common liposarcoma to show up in the skin, which is very strange. Um, liposarcomas do not often involve the skin, but when they do, mic I'm sorry, uh, pleomorphic liposarcoma is the one that you tend to see. And when we, uh, we published a paper about this, actually, um, I was my fellowship project when I was a fellow with Dr. Weiss, um, and we published a paper about li uh, pleomorphic liposarcoma in the skin and subcutis and found that when it's a, uh, a lesion that's in the skin or subcutis, it behaves much better. And none of our patients died of disease that we know of, at least uh, of the patients we had follow up on in our series. And I think our series is still the largest series of, uh, of superficial pleomorphic liposarcomas. I think we had around 29 cases or 30 cases. We didn't have follow up on all of them. I'll, I'll put a link down below if you want some light bedtime reading, you can check it out. But in any case, it was, uh, it was actually the first time that I remember being really excited about a research project because we actually found something that was different and kind of unexpected. I mean, um, some sarcomas we know when they're small or superficial behave better, but other sarcomas don't. Like when rhabdomyosarcomas are in the skin, they're still very aggressive. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting to find a, something that actually made a difference and, and portended a better prognosis for those patients. So, in any case, just know that these do sometimes occur in the skin.